going to be here. It's my first time in Asia, believe it or not. Um, never made the trip out yet. I was excited to come to Hong Kong. Thanks for being here today. So a uh, slightly different presentation style. I have a couple of uh, slides I'm going to go through, talk about some things, and then uh, I'm going to get Andrew back up on stage to, to have a fireside chat about uh, some of the ideas and, and thoughts. So quick background. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, I run Civic full time. It's a decentralized identity platform. Um, I'm a partner at Newtown Partners, which is a token economy design company, and Multicoin Capital is a crypto hedge fund. So with Civic, our vision is to decentralize identity. We want you to be able to go through passport control one day using just your phone and your credentials, which are validated by, uh, by a blockchain, and ensuring that uh, ID credentials are stored by you when uh, big companies get hacked and the information gets out there. Hopefully it's not yours because it will be decentralized. But that's the vision we're building towards. And uh, we did an ICO a year ago, and it's been, it's been great for the company and putting out a utility token. Uh, something which I think it's, 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 it's still a very new and emerging uh, type of technology and categorization of, of tokens, and I'll, I'll jump into that further. But uh, just quick background on Civic. Decentralized identity platform, users are in control of the data, it leverages the existing Bitcoin blockchain and the node infrastructure that's there, so we don't store any of your personal information, it's all stored on, um, on your device and the hashes are put on the blockchain. And that's our token sale, and it's a real utility token. So when companies want to do ID verification, they have to use this token to make a, uh, a validation check. So I want to talk with today about something slightly outside this. It's more on the governance of, of uh, crypto. And so I thought I'd start off with talking about um, what I call intangible social constructs. This is the stuff which, you know, a company, it doesn't really exist. There's no physical, I mean, you can go, there's a building, sure, but the notion of a company, it's something which is, it exists under the laws of a, a jurisdiction. You have a, a, a deed, a register, you have shares. These are not physical objects. You know, debt to an extent as well, debt, collateralized debt, et cetera, these are documentations. This is, these are social contracts. Society recognizes these things. Money as well. Um, marriage, you know, marriage certificate. It's not a physical object. And identity as well, who you are and who you tell people you are, to a large extent, is based upon social constructs that we've constructed over centuries, uh, but we agree, with, uh, you know, we agree today what it is in society. What, what are regulations? Well, regulations are what enforces a lot of these social constructs. And so, regulators exist today to ensure there's fair play in society. So shareholders get returns, uh, they own shares, they, they, there's obligations owed to them, etc. Enforcement of the laws and punishing bad actors is an important part of regulation. So again, the regulations have come out of decades and decades of seeing what works, what doesn't work in the securities markets, etc. And as we're going to this era of regulations in crypto, uh, it's becoming a, a, a hot topic of discussion. And so when we talk about protections from regulators, who are they protecting? They're typically protecting unsuspecting or, or, or unsophisticated investors, people who are buying tokens. We all know the, I think Andrew gave a taste of the, the BitConnect um, situation uh, and how people are just pouring money into, into scams and into uh, Ponzi schemes, etc. And these investors, they don't know better. So regulators are now waking up and saying, well, we have to protect our citizens. We have to protect our people because this industry as it's emerging has got a lot of bad actors in it. And so if you look through history, what happens is when industries don't self-regulate in the sense that, that the, the business leaders don't come together and argue for a, a code of conduct and, and operating practices that becomes uniform across the industry, the regulators get involved and they impose regulations. And this can be a scary thing for companies that are operating even with good intentions because it, it drives up the cost of doing business in a big way. So what I'm seeing right now today is is we're waking up to the reality that the crypto community cannot survive without uh, being somewhat within the, the, the purview of regulators. So we have to make a decision. Are we going to sit back and watch the regulators regulate us, or are we going to advocate for more sensible uh, industry best practices that we can, we can take across the industry and, and enforce ourselves and push our bad actors without having the governments come in and tell us how to regulate? So 
when we talk about governments coming in, I mean, if you look at what's been going on in the past year in crypto through the fervor that's, that's gone on in 2017, we've seen Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes, matrix schemes, pumps and dumps, you, you, know, you name it, it's happened, and it's still happening. And so this is, this is going to be under the, the microscope for the rest of this year, and the, I believe that we will see regulations come in, but there, is, there are some things we can probably do around that as well to try and prevent too much regulations from bearing down on in our industry. So, dilemmas. Um, you know, if you look through, throughout history, and again, I, I take a philosophical view on it, there are, there are a lot of dilemmas out there. There's the scaling dilemma, where you're trying to trade off decentralization for secur with security, with scalability, with cost. Um, these, are, these, are, these are dilemmas which haven't been solved yet, and we're, we're still trying. You've got Hobson's choice is one I, I like, is where you, you have a, um, a starving donkey um, oh, sorry, no, Hobson's choice is a different one. Uh, uh, that's the next one. Yeah, yeah Buddy and Zess, sorry. <laughs> Hobson's choice is you have two bad choices. Which one do you take, right? And, and this is a, a philosophical dilemma. Uh, Buddy and Zess is one where you, it's a, a philosophical one where you have this donkey where it's starving and it is, uh, it's hungry at the same time. And if you put it in the middle between equidistant from, the, from water and from food, it'll die because it won't know which way to go. And so, again, we have all these philosophical, these, uh, these philosophical uh, questions around dilemmas. Um, and then Morton's fork was, uh, oh, I'm losing that one now. That was the two bad. Who remembers this one? Sorry, I blanked. And then the value trap dilemma was the, the one, I, I wrote a blog post yesterday um, on uh, vinnylingham.com talking about what I've defined as the value trap dilemma. This dilemma is an interesting one. It's basically when you have a token sale, as a company, you, have, you actually have two masters at that point to an extent. You've got, taken money in from token holders who've bought the token, but you have shareholders on the other side who want returns. And shareholders in a company want profits, right? So, so the, the social construct we're, we're all accustomed to is you buy shares in a company, there's an expectation of profit. If you're buying a utility token or a security token, you have different expectations. What do you do when a company issues a, a, a utility token to utility hold, uh, token holders, but the shareholders want profits? How do you balance the resources between, uh, the, you know, between those two assets? I mean, for example, if you, have a, um, if you have a company that's functioning today with existing revenues, and now you issue a utility token, and you have a client that comes to you and says, look, we really like this done. We'll give you a million dollars uh, in development fees. Please develop it for us. What happens if you take your two best developers off the token economy project and move them to the other project where the token holders don't benefit? In fact, it slows down the roadmap for what's happening in the token economy, but the company shareholders benefit now because there's a million dollars in extra income that's coming to the company because the project is taken on. Where does the fiduciary responsibility to token holders and shareholders begin and end? And this is a philosophical debate. So, Shareholders, again, they want profits. So how do we change the mindset that shareholders buying into companies that issue tokens that there's no profit there? The profit is, is in the future. It, it, it's, it's what, how do we capture the imagination of shareholders so that they realize that the company is a vehicle for building something bigger? And if you look at people like Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, what they've done, I mean, Jeff Bezos deferred profits in Amazon for a very long time. I mean, it, you know, decades. And, and a lot of people didn't buy into that vision that you could just build, 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 eventually get to profits. But in the world we live in today, most of us have investors or have had investors that demand short-term returns. And if you're then selling a token, you have that revenue in, coming in from the token sale, how do you balance the two out? Token holders want a piece of the ecosystem, and when they're buying the token from you, they're expecting you to put those resources to work to further the... The, the goals and whatever you've laid out in your white paper around, uh, around the token economy that you're building. So you have to be very smart about how you do it and how you allocate those resources. And so balancing these resource demands is something which I think a lot of CEOs and, and board members and people within companies are struggling with today. It's not, a simple, um, it's not a simple problem, I can tell you. And when we look at the crypto companies, they, because they're not foundations, so the Ethereum Foundation is actually a very good example of a foundation where there's no, they don't have shareholders. They don't answer to anyone. They put the money back into building Ethereum out, and it's been very successful over the years. 
So, Andrew, where are you? Right here. All right, cool. So we're going to get into a, a, it's kind of a fireside chat around some of these, these questions that are out there. Said, I can't let this man have the stage all to himself. I got to get my digs in, you know? Thanks for, ha <laughs> thanks for letting me share the stage with you. No He's not my cousin Vinny, but I am glad to be up here with him. <laughs> You've outlined something really, really interesting and something that I think is one of the least uh, considered aspects of ICOs and how companies are structured. I mean, the, the tokenomics is typically the most mm -hmm. neglected part of, of what's done, but also the most important. Um, you know, there's this conflict, is, you know, that you've just outlined between shareholders and token holders is the new dimension. And then, you know, customers, who? Yep. <laughs> I mean, how, how are we going to square that? How are we going to square that circle? So th this is the, so this is the dilemma, right? This is the dilemma. How do you get... What do you do when your best customers are coming to you and willing to pay you money, but you've already taken money from token holders to build an economy? Yeah. Like, how do you balance that out? And, and so, the, so it, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult for, I'd say, existing companies, two, three, four, five-year-old companies to, to do this because they've got, um, com they've got customers paying their money, they've got overheads, et cetera, but they've also sold a token. Yeah. And, and there's, where's, where's, you know, it's a classic agency problem times 10. Yep. Right. The uh, the founders, you know, a lot of them don't have the incentive. They kind of drift off into the ether, and nothing happens. Um, so, you know, how do you manage rewards, especially when they're shareholders and so, token so holders? I, I can tell you what we've done at Civic. So we we've taken the view that that our token economy, the CVC economy, is a public service, and the company exists to further that that service and build out that infrastructure. So we operate to a large extent as a foundation for at least the interim period while we're busy building the infrastructure out. And we can only do that because our shareholders have been on board with, with the notion of what we're trying to do. We're saying, look, there's no profits. We're not, we're not going to be selling services. We've had companies come to us and offer us a half a million dollars to do projects. And what it's, uh, we just, if it doesn't benefit the token economy, we don't do it, even as a for-profit company. Now, Jeff Bezos, he somehow managed that with you know, the people that backed Amazon. You guys seem to have done it. But that can't be easy. I mean, you know, it's yeah. the, the old way of doing things is an easier sell. How did you sell and how did you find the people that would buy into this vision? So, so I, I mean, to a large extent, obviously, I've been fortunate because I've had a previous exit. So I have a lot of my old investors coming in and backing me again um, on this company. And so, you know, a lot of it is just trust. Uh, they trust that we will do the right thing and we will, we will build the company out. I think it's, it's a lot harder when you also have... Um, a high concentration of share control in one, inter in one company. In our company, the founders control the company in terms of the shareholding, and all our investors have smaller stakes, sub 10% each. So there's not enough control from investors to force us to be uh, short-term focused as a company. So we are long-term focused, and we are looking to, to build out this token infrastructure, and, and, and this is why we did what we did with the token sale, and we're using those funds to build it out, and you know, investors are going to have to be patient for it. How is it different in convincing the token community? Because, you know, we all say it's all about building a beautiful ecosystem, but let's face it, a lot of the people that are, that are trading in tokens, they're not on board with that mission, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where it comes into, like, the utility versus speculative nature of tokens. If you look at utility tokens today, they, uh, many companies are selling or, or, or producing a utility token that doesn't actually have utility today, and this is where the, the SEC and the regulators are getting you know, their backs up. Um, if it is a utility token, it needs to be able to be used today in completing a task. If it's a security, then it was used for the purpose of raising money and financing um, a, 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 you know, a, a, an economy. Um, so I think it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough one right now. It is really, it's, there, there, there are too many companies going out there and promising utility, but the, the, the token economy hasn't been well formed yet. Yeah. Is, is there anybody that you think is doing it right out there? Like, I know you, you've kind of identified this problem. You know, you just kind of put the, you know, kind of put the word out there, put your, your flag in the ground. Do you think anybody, is there anybody you can point to that you think is doing a really good job of considering, you know, these different, these competing interests and how they're going to be resolved? I, I'm, the answer is I'm not sure because I don't, I don't sit on the boards of these companies, so I can only judge people from the actions that they take publicly, not the discussions they have behind the scenes. And I think I don't want to make, I don't want to say people are not doing it, but I, I, I just, some of the actions are concerning. The, the speculative nature of the markets right now means that if the utility isn't forthcoming, the prices are going to come down because it's just speculation. If there's real utility and demand, I mean, we've seen with Ethereum, for example, because of the demand for Ethereum for ICOs and ERC-20 tokens, the price did move up substantially, and now the price is moving down because of the regulations coming in to a large extent.
Yeah, it's a new it's a new field, so we're going to judge people on their actions, you know, as those develop. But are people in your space? Are you having conversations with people like yourself, the leaders? Yeah. In this, a lot yeah. of them, a lot of them are here today. I mean, are you having those conversations uh, over drinks or? I've hinted towards some sort of industry bodies. So I've had some conversations with um, some well, you know, high profile um, entrepreneurs in the space, and I think that the general consensus is that we need to form an industry body to create some level of, you know, self-regulatory governance where we agree on what the guardrails are for what we're doing. It is happening. It's happening slowly. But I think once you have one or two or three or four in industry bodies, you can have one for each country and all sort of work together. It's going to make a big difference because at least people buying in will know that the companies who are committing to the, a certain basic level of governance uh, are a bit more trustworthy than ones that just pop up. And, and it, I mean, we've... We've all heard all the scams, people running away, using the money to buy Lambos, etc. Like, it's, yeah. you know, uh, sure. yeah. we, we need to clean up the industry to an extent. Do you think that conversation should happen at a national level? Because, you know, what you see are people saying, well, if we, if we gather together, we self-regulate. We're dealing with our national regulators. We're trying to keep our national regulators happy, which is different from creating, you know, a truly innovative, uh, you know, uh, self-governing system that is going to take care of customers, that's going to take care of token holders. I mean, on one hand, it's like satisfy the regulators, or is it create something really amazing that's going to change the world? And does that conversation happen at the national level or a global? So I've spoken to regulators around the world, and I can say almost emphatically across all regulators worldwide that I've spoken to, they don't want to crush innovation. They, they really don't. Like, they're, they're excited about what's happening. They just want to ensure that, the, you know, that they, their job is protecting people from the bad actors. Yeah. So you, the more you can give them, the more ammunition you can give them to basically allow the industry to operate as freely with as little regulation as possible, the happier they are to support that. But the moment you, know, you, you endorse the bad actors, that's when they, it's going to get a little tougher. Yeah, I mean, the regulators, they want to do the right thing. Sometimes they can't help themselves, but stifle. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it, it just, exactly. It happens. Um, what, what is the platform for having that conversation in, in these bodies? Do, is, have you got something in the hopper right now, or is it you're looking to connect with people here? Should they come and talk to you? No, I, I think it's it, everyone in their circles knows people get doing something in this space. I, I would just encourage you to get involved. If you hear or you want to start an industry body to, for, your, for your part of the world, do it. If you, you know, if know someone's doing it, join them. I think the more active we become in, in, in self-regulating, the better it is for the industry. So the, the more that people get involved in this, the better, I think. Sounds good. Um, could, do you want to remind people where they can find your piece that you posted, the DVT post? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, on, on? Do you want to remind people where you, you posted your manifesto so they can track it down? Oh, manifesto, uh, I didn't post a manifesto. I'm calling it a manifesto. I mean, I thought it oh, was Oh, my blog post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, vinnylingham.com. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's good. So I think, are we out of time? Yeah, we're running a little bit slow right. on time. You got, any, you got any parting shots that you want to take, Vinny? Um, well, yeah, actually, I, the, the one thing I'll, I'll just touch on quickly is token economy design. Yeah. So utility tokens need to actually have utility. If you're trying to sell a utility token and it's a security, just be honest about it because, quite frankly, the regulatory environment is going to get tougher. And so if, it's, if you're using the utility token to raise money, call it a security and go through the process of raising money as a security. Don't, don't try and you know, a wolf, pass a wolf off in sheep's clothing. Yeah, we just, we just had a company get smacked down by the SFC here in Hong Kong yesterday. And I mean, you know, already the reverberations yep. are coming across. Other token uh, sales have been told to halt operations. I mean, it's out there and it's... Uh, yeah, th it this is everybody. bad. This is bad for the industry. The more the negative stuff comes out, it's just bad overall. We, you know, and this is, this is, so let's be honest with, the, with ourselves of what we're trying to do here. Um, and, and you can actually sell a security token. I mean, there, there, there are a bunch of security exchanges coming out there. The liquidity is not quite there yet, but it's happening, and you can deliver returns. So I, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Um, you know, what, what the, what, one of the things I'm seeing from a lot of entrepreneurs, they're coming in and they're saying, look, we've got all these buyers lined up. We can raise five million bucks tomorrow. We'll worry about the token economy design later. That is just a bad, that's a bad approach. Like, Token economy design is an important part of what you're doing. Don't take the money in and then worry about how you're going to make it work later on. I, look, I, it is a good argument for why you should always take the money quickly, but I think be thoughtful about what you're doing because if you can't make the token economy work, it's going to be bad for you long term. Yeah, but I mean, where do they go for expertise? Because I mean, there's no shortage of people that will help you with marketing, that'll manage your Telegram accounts, that'll help you get the word out and push, you know, pump, pump, pump. But if you say, who are the real experts in designing solid tokenomics? They're, they're, these people are hard to find. There, there, there are a few firms out there that are really good and there's a lot of bad ones. Who are your faves? Well, I, like I'm a co-founder of Newtown Partners, so that's, we, okay. we, we do that. But, but we're a boutique. We, we do a couple of deals a year. That's it. Um, 
Okay. And, uh, and there's a few others out there. Okay. You, you, you've thrown a question up there that's something, yeah. you know, when you see people reform their tokenomics mid ICO, you know, and I've asked, I've, I've talked to other people about this and said, you know, is that a sign that they're just in full panic mode and they don't know what they're doing? Or does it mean that, you know, or are they actually undertaking something useful? Uh, that helps to make for a better. So, so I'll tell you what actually happens from my perspective in this world. Okay, so you have this token design. You go out there, you put it out, you get a whole bunch of so-called dumb money in, and the dumb money is people who don't understand how this stuff works, but they start saying, "Yes, five hundred thousand, yes, a million bucks, etc." All of a sudden, you have ten million dollars, and now you want to go and close your twenty or whatever it is, and then you start going to the smart money funds. So, like multi-coin capital example. Of, uh, you know, and you start giving us your token economy designs, and we go back and say, well, we're not going to put money in because of this or because of that. And then the entrepreneurs start saying, okay, well, hang on a second. I, I, we can get the dumb money in, and just because dumb money is in doesn't mean smart money comes behind it. The smart money wants these changes. Let's go make these changes. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's kind of a slippery slope because basically what you're saying is we don't really believe in what we're doing. We're just trying to market to you and get you guys excited about, about this, and we'll listen after we've raised the money. But how do I know that after we give you the money, you won't change it again for the next group of people who want to come in? Okay, so, you know, people's hearts got to be in the right place. They got to think deeply about how they're serving not only their shareholders, but also their token holders and their communities. Um, they got to have pride in their work and maybe pride in the community, which you could also call civic pride. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Vinny Lingham, the CEO of Civic. All thank right, you. thank you. Thank you.